Hello, welcome. The Bible is an amazing book. It tells about the Lamb of God that wants to choose you to live with Him. But it also tells us about the future. In this video, we're going to take a look at some of the kingdoms that will exert an influence over the people of the world at the time of the end. In order to see those things, we have to begin at the beginning. Daniel chapter 2 will be the starting point for us in this study. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we ask that thou be with us now. Lord, make us channels through which thy love can flow day by day and hour by hour. And we claim this according to the promise that you've given us in your word. Bless us with your spirit, Lord, we ask in thy name. Amen. The title of our video is, Who Taught the Greatest King on the Earth About the Creator of the Universe? Let's turn to Daniel 2 and get the idea of why this chapter is so important. I have my iPad right here. I'm going to be using, uh, just to kind of indicate where we are, and you'll see that on the screen, that we're in Daniel uh, chapter 2, verse 1. And it says, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep brake from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, the astrologers, sorcerers, the Chaldeans, to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream. My spirit was troubled to know the dream. And then he continued and said, The thing is gone from me. The story begins with a dream that the king of Babylon had just had the night before. He was obviously troubled by the dream, and he called all his wise persons. But the problem is he doesn't remember what the dream was about. Asking these wise men, they say to him, well, tell us the, the dream and we'll interpret it. And he said, no, you tell me the dream, and then I'll believe that you can give me the interpretation. Well, they can't do that, so they get into really hot water. Because of this, the king gets mad, and he threatens these wise men with destruction. But God introduces Daniel. He's a captive Jew that's been taken from Jerusalem, and he's now in the kingdom of Babylon. Daniel approaches the king and asks for time, and it is granted. So where we pick up the story is in Daniel 2.26. Now, I'm going to go to the iPad, and I want you to look at it, what this king is asking him. It's in Daniel 2.26, and then we're going to go and look at something. Here it is, Daniel 2.26, you can see it. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. So it's you know, obviously his name is Daniel, but they call him Belteshazzar in this kingdom of Babylon. He says, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen, and the interpretation thereof? And Daniel is able to do that. We're going to be looking at this in a little bit different form. What we're going to do is take all the words, put them on one side uh, according to how the uh, vision was described, and on the other side we're going to put how it is interpreted by Daniel. Here is our newest format. On the left column, you can see Daniel 2, 28 to 35. It's going to tell us about the dream. On the right column, you can see Daniel 2, 37 to 45, and that's going to tell us the interpretation. So as we look at verse 28, we can read together. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and maketh known to the king, that is Nebuchadnezzar, there he is, what shall be in the latter days, the days that come tomorrow and the next day, next week, next month. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. Verse 29, Daniel says, As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed, what should come to pass hereafter. So he's repeating what he just said, but he's going to tell him, that is Nebuchadnezzar, that God was showing him the future. And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. Verse 30. But as for me, the secret is not revealed to me for any vision that I have more than any living, any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king. So he's given us the interpretation, not just to Nebuchadnezzar, but also to us. 
that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Verse 31. Here we go. Thou, O king, camest to behold a great image. Here is our key. This great image, all right, so it repeats it, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. So I'm going to advance this a little bit so you can kind of get the idea of what's coming next. Verse 32. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Then he goes on to verse 34, and let's go to that. Thou sawest till a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet. So the stone comes against the image. So this feet that were a part of iron and clay and break them into pieces, 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together. So they, the idea is that it was not just the feet, but everything else about the image was broken and became like the chaff of the summer, threshing floors. Anytime wheat or some other uh, grain is, uh, taking, um, is threshed, what it has to do is you mix it up, you try to get rid of the, the covering so you can get the actual kernel, what's important. Now, what happens to the chaff? It says, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became what? A great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. So verse 36, this is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. So he has finished the dream. Now we need to go back up to the right column, and we'll be able to see that it's an interpretation. So the very next verse is 37. Thou king art the king of kings. So he's telling him what he is. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. So where did King Nebuchadnezzar get his power? From God. So you got the king, got the God of heaven, God of heaven. This is the relationship. This is what he's given you. 38. And, whether, and wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand. Pretty big king. And he made thee ruler over them all. So now we're going to get into what the interpretation is. Where does he start? He says, you are this head of gold. What is that referring to? That verse 32. The image's head was a fine gold. So who is the head of gold? It's Babylon. Why is it important? Because we're going to find out that this is a key to help us understand Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 9, Daniel 11, Daniel 12. All of it comes from this. Okay? All right. Verse 39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom. All right, so Babylon will have to be called the first kingdom, and this would be the second kingdom. If you go back to verse 32, it says, Breast and arms, they are of a, what? There's silver. Okay? All right. And then as we continue with verse 39, it says, And another third kingdom of brass. All right, got that one. Which shall bear rule over all the earth. What's it referring to from 32? Probably his belly and thighs. Go to verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth uh, uh, all things, as iron breaketh all these, it shall break in pieces and bruise. So we're talking about the fourth kingdom. So I know for sure I got the fourth kingdom. But what's interesting is we're going to see if we match it up with a verse on the other side, verse 33, how many legs do you have? You have two legs, not one. And what's interesting is that we're going to find that this fourth kingdom is actually going to be two kingdoms. So we have the one, and then we have the second one. And we're going to see that um, revealed in chapter 7 and chapter 8 of Daniel. 
going to verse 41. So I'm going to pull that up just a little bit so we can kind of see what, what we're doing here. And this is, Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And verse 42. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. So here we have something that's introduced. Feet. To me, that's number six. And we're going to find that number seven is also part of this, and that's the toes. So here we go down to verse 44. And as the Days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. So he's talking about the stone kingdom, isn't he? Which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand for how long? Forever. 45. For as much then as thou sawest, the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. So that's where the stone came from, was, was from a mountain. Okay, so we're trying to figure out what's going on with the stone. For as much then as thou sawest, the stone was cut, cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. And then we finish up here. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. This is future. This is prophecy, isn't it? And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. So here we have, we've gone through this. We've got the idea that we know that there is a dream, okay? And then we're given the interpretation of it. We know that it starts with Nebuchadnezzar, because it states that. We know that for sure. And we know that uh, Daniel is there, and what Daniel is doing is helping us with the interpretation. So here we have a great image. I'd like to um, just focus on that for a minute. If you notice that as Daniel goes through the interpretation here, he's telling us that there are seven kingdoms, right? Okay, so we've got that idea. Uh, we've got the head of gold. We know it's Babylon. We're not told about the second or the third, the fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh, but we're told that it begins with this head of gold. All right? So if we have a great image, what would the great image represent? I'm looking at a image. That image tells me that it's probably an idol. An idol is something that was made by man saying, if you can't see God, let me show it to you. So this kingdom we're looking at is not just a kingdom of God. We're looking at the kingdom of man, or I think we're looking at the kingdom of Satan. So why bring that up? Because God is showing us through these kingdoms here how Satan is going to lead the world, okay? But then it comes to a part where we see that the stone comes along and it says, no, this kingdom of Satan is coming to an end. It comes from a mountain without hands. It, this is not man-made. This is a stone. What kind of stone would break all these things? To me, that's a diamond. I think that that is an excellent representation of the kingdom of God. So here you have an idea that from a story that begins here with Nebuchadnezzar, 
it goes all the way to the time when Jesus comes again and sets up the kingdom of God. We're going to find out that this is something that God wants us to know. Okay, so we understand just reading in Daniel 2 that there was an important lesson here. What was the lesson? There is a great controversy. It's between the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. He says, okay, you're going to see these seven kingdoms, but remember that the kingdom of diamond is coming. Jesus is coming again. He has won for us the ability to be part of his family, to be his sons and daughters. And he's going to make us kings and priests. It's in the first chapter of Revelation. He tells us all of these things that we might understand that where you are now, I'm going to give you information that you might believe. As it says in John 14, 29, These things I have given to you in prophecy, that you might have greater faith that you can trust in me. I knew that they would come, but I am here to save you. And that's what Jesus does, doesn't he? If we trust in him and his word, especially a verse like John 3, 16, he says, I've loved you. I'm going to save you. I want you with me forever. And he shows you by showing you, this is what Satan is going to show. But I'm coming and you can trust in that. It's the kingdom of the diamond. Wait for it. It will come. What is the big picture that we can take from Daniel 2? That's easy. First, God has just placed before your eyes the master plan of Satan. There will be the seven kingdoms that you must know about. These kingdoms are creations by the king of this world. His name is Satan. We've already talked about that. He is showing you that there is another choice. You don't have to follow God. You can follow me. Satan is showing you that you do not have to do what God tells you. He is a liar. Revelation tells you that there that he will be thrown into the lake of fire. This master plan of Satan will lead you to eternal death. Do not take it. After the seven kingdoms of the world of Satan are visualized, the vision shows you that Jesus has won it for you. It is the diamond kingdom. This diamond kingdom of the Father has no end. He's died on the cross that you might have a second chance. Trust in him. He'll forgive you of his sins and fill you with his spirit. If you choose it, he will help you make it. Number three, Jesus told us why he gives us prophecy. It's in John 14, 29. I have told you before it comes to pass that when it does come to pass, you will have greater belief in me. That's the reason for prophecy. You can trust it. In the next video, let's study the powers of the end of the world from Daniel 7. Remember, click to subscribe to get the next video. It's in the right upper corner of the screen. Until the next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you.